Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss classical and modern jurisprudence. Today's episode features Christopher Green, Professor of Law and Jamie L. Witten, Chair in Law and Government at the University of Mississippi School of Law. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Professor Green, can you tell us what kinds of questions philosophers ask? The kinds of questions that philosophy deals with, broadly speaking, there are several different fields. Ethics is one big area of philosophy, right and wrong. So what is the nature of right and wrong? What does it mean for something to be right? What particular actions are right or wrong? normative considerations like that. That's the realm of ethics. Another field is epistemology. So how do we know things? So the kinds of questions that you ask after you watch a movie where the hero comes out of a brain in a vat. So the Matrix movie from long ago. How do we know whether or not we are just brains in vats circling on a planet on Alpha Centauri? Is everything that we encounter just a dream? So Rene Descartes wondered about this. How do we know things? How do we know anything at all? What particular things can we know? How much should we trust our senses as opposed to testimony from other people? This sort of consideration is epistemology. So how clear are things in particular how clear do things have to be for particular purposes? That's the kind of thing that epistemologists worry about. Metaphysics, or sometimes they like to call it ontology, has to do with the things that are, the structure of reality. So you can ask questions like the ship of Theseus. You have a ship that is made out of wood and the wooden planks have to be gradually replaced if you take all those planks one by one and replace them with new planks, is it the same ship as it was before? Even though all of the material in the ship is different, if it has the same form and the structure has been the same over time, is that the same ship? That's the kind of thing that metaphysics considers. So metaphysics considers questions about the nature of things, the nature of entities. Epistemology talks about how we know things, our knowledge, our cognitive access to things. Ethics talks about what we should do, how we should act toward things. That is a very succinct explanation. What about legal inquiry? Does it deal with the same questions? Does it do so in a distinct way? Law. What is the nature of law? All three of those sorts of areas show up in the law. Ethics and metaphysics and epistemology. So ethics, the right and wrong thing to do, obviously is constantly involved in the law. Law is telling people to do things. Some things that law tells people to do are wrong in themselves. Some of them are wrong only because the law tells them to do it. So there's a great distinction in the law, in the criminal law, between malum in se crimes and malum prohibitum crimes. This is a distinction, by the way, that is described in both the Legally Blonde movie and in True Grit. The movie. So in Legally Blonde, the professor asks the Reese Witherspoon character, would you rather have a client who committed a malum in se crime or a malum prohibitum crime? And she says, well, I want to have a client who didn't commit any crimes, who's innocent. And Victor Garber, the professor, says, well, dare to dream, Miss Woods. The smarmy classmate then pipes up and say, well, I would prefer to have a client who'd only committed a malum prohibitum crime because that's just a regulatory offense. In True Grit, we have a short dissertation from the Matt Damon character. He says, now, shooting the senator's dog, that was arguably malum prohibitum. But shooting the senator, that is indubitably malum in se. The Jeff Bridges character then acts confused and the little girl character says, 
That's a distinction between things wrong in themselves and things wrong merely because of social mores. It is Latin. So distinguishing between malum prohibitum and malum in se in the law requires an analysis of ethics. You have to know that there are things that are wrong in themselves, and there are other things that are wrong merely because they are prohibited. Making that distinction requires an analysis of ethics. Metaphysics and epistemology, or ontology in epistemology, is an important distinction in the law, or could be an important distinction in the law, because there's a difference between how things are, the nature of entities, entities like the Constitution. There's a distinction between how things are and how much knowledge we have of those things. So it's possible for the Constitution to be a certain thing for the Constitution to consist of meaning expressed at a particular point in time according to the linguistic legal conventions of that time. It's possible for the Constitution to be a certain thing, but us not to know it or not to know it perfectly, not to know it as clearly as we might like to know it. So there's a distinction in the law between how it is and how much we know about it. This is important for a couple of issues in the law. One is the issue of deference from a court to a legislature. If a court doesn't know exactly what the Constitution requires in a particular circumstance, there's a long tradition of saying, in unclear cases, the judiciary has to defer to the legislature on issues of constitutionality. In Fletcher versus Peck, only in a clear case the Supreme Court says, does it exercise judicial review? Similarly, there's issues about epistemology in precedent. So one theory that several justices have indicated, Justice Thomas talks about demonstrably erroneous precedent. Precedent that whose error has been demonstrated is very, very clear. Justice Breyer says that if it's an extremely important case, you better be damn sure that a precedent is wrong before you overrule it. Justice Stevens, in his McDonald versus Chicago dissent the day he retires, says that the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause is not as clear as it would need to be to dislodge 137 years of precedent. So according to Stevens' view, the more precedent we get, the bigger the dislodging reliance interest costs, the more certainty you have to have about original meaning in order to overrule a decision. So you want to distinguish the ontological question, what does it mean to violate the Constitution? According to Justice Stevens, it's the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but then you've got the reliance interest dislodging 137 years of precedent, and as that goes up and up, you need more clarity about the underlying ontological question, more clarity about the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause in order to overrule a precedent. We've established that both law and philosophy deal with making distinctions. Can you say more about that? Both law and philosophy are in the distinction drawing game. So if you think about what a lawyer does, very frequently what will happen at an oral argument, a judge will say, well, what about this case? Isn't this case like your case? And this case that I proposed seems like it has an answer that does not produce the answer that you're trying to get in your facts for your client. What does the lawyer have to do? Well, generally, a lawyer can respond to a question by either saying, well, you're wrong about the answer in that hypothetical, or the lawyer can draw a distinction between that case, the hypothetical that the judge has proposed, and the case before the court, the case that they're, they're talking about. Drawing distinctions is the lawyer's game. You know who else is in the distinction drawing game? Philosophers. Philosophers love to either say there's a distinction between two kinds of things or say there's not a distinction. That's the history of the field ever since Plato. They've been saying this thing is distinct from this other thing or this thing is like another thing. What is analogous to what? What is disanalogous from what? That's the name of the game, both in law and in philosophy, both in academic law and in academic philosophy.
both law and philosophy very, very much want not to be sloppy. If you look at how law proceeds, it proceeds very, very slowly. They say the wheels of justice grind very slowly, but they grind very, very fine. And philosophy is one way to think of it. It's the art of thinking slowly, not jumping to conclusions, being careful about exactly what the premises are, taking arguments, turning them upside down, seeing if you can deny conclusions and run that as an argument for denying premises. That's exactly the kind of thing that happens in the law as well. We have premises, we have conclusions, we've got arguments from the premises to the conclusions, and we think about taking that argument and turning it upside down. So because both lawyers and judges and philosophers and philosophy students and people thinking about the subjects of philosophy, so ethics or epistemology or metaphysics, people thinking about either of these fields very much want not to be sloppy. It makes a lot of sense for lawyers, if they don't want to be sloppy, to pay attention to the results from people who are one way to think about it is the people who are not sloppy for a living. That's what philosophers are. They're people who very, very much try not to be sloppy. If you look at what, especially in the analytic tradition, sometimes philosophers, you look at what they do and you look at, well, you might think they've made no progress at all because they've been so focused on not being sloppy, being absolutely and totally rigorous. You might think, ah, this isn't really any different from math. On the other hand, it's much better to make a very, very small amount of progress very securely than to jump ahead and do something that you're going to have to undo later because it turns out you've made a bunch of assumptions that turn out to be false. Let's talk more about the types of things that both lawyers and philosophers need to distinguish. Do you have an example of how a small distinction might make a big difference? So one distinction that is made both in the law and in philosophy is a distinction that philosophers talk about as the distinction between mind to world and world to mind directions of fit. In the law, this, I think, is the distinction that Hamilton draws in Federalist 78. Hamilton in Federalist 78 says that judges, the judiciary, they exercise not will, but judgment. So to be a judge is to make a judgment about an external existing reality. It's not to exercise will or a decision to make something be the case to make something be a certain way. Well, there's a distinction that philosophers draw and there's a wonderful story. It's a, sort of a, a story of Elizabeth Anscombe that was modified then by John Searle. This is the story of the shopper and the spy. So we imagine somebody at the grocery store and that person has a list. He's got a list of things he's supposed to get at the grocery store and it says, plain yogurt. So this fellow is going around looking for the plain yogurt. And he thinks to himself, plain yogurt, what's the plainest sort of yogurt there is? He sees vanilla yogurt, plain vanilla yogurt. That's the plainest sort of yogurt there is. He takes the vanilla yogurt and puts it in his shopping cart. Of course, we all know plain yogurt is not the same thing as vanilla yogurt. Plain yogurt is something you probably would not want to eat by itself. It's usually an ingredient for something else. So this is a shopper who is being investigated by an intelligence agency. So we have a spy who has been following this fellow around the grocery store and the spy is looking to see how ordinary a fellow is this. Is this shopper perhaps also a spy? So as the spy is following the shopper around the grocery store, the spy is writing down everything in the grocery cart. So we have one list of things that the shopper is using, the shopping list at the grocery store. Then we have a cart filled with stuff. And then we have the spy's report. And if everything goes according to plan, 
we will have one list of things from the shopper, and that will match the cart. And then we'll have another list on the spies report, which will be an identical list of things that matches the cart. But notice, we have the shopper who made a mistake, confused vanilla yogurt with plain yogurt. So the shopper puts vanilla yogurt in the cart. And suppose the spy is similarly inexperienced in the ways of yogurt and looks at the vanilla yogurt and thinks, wow, this is a pretty ordinary kind of guy. He gets the plainest kind of yogurt there is. And he writes down on his report, plain yogurt. So then we have a shopping list that says plain yogurt. We have a spy's report that says plain yogurt. And then we have vanilla yogurt in the cart. Well, then suppose the spy, as he's going around the, the grocery store, gets a phone call from his superior and his boss spy says, hey, how's it going? What does that fellow look like? Is he an ordinary sort of fellow or pretty unusual? And the spy says, oh, he's a very plain sort of guy. He just got plain yogurt and put it into his cart. And then the spy's boss says, well, wait a minute. Remember, there's a difference between plain yogurt and vanilla yogurt. And the spy says, oh, yes, 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 yes. Of course, I, uh, I knew the difference between that. And then he looks carefully into the cart and sees it's vanilla. And he says, oh, I, I made a mistake. I confused plain and vanilla yogurt. And then the spy goes to his report, crosses out plain, and writes vanilla. Why does that make sense? Because the spy's report has a mind to world direction of fit. His mind, the list of things in his report, is attempting to match the shopping cart, okay? So if he turns out there's an error, well, just change the list. As long as the list matches the shopping cart, it's going to be fine. Imagine that the shopper going around the store looks at an ad and suddenly realizes, oh, there's a sale on plain yogurt, but not a sale on vanilla yogurt. And he thinks to himself, well, you know, I've never actually thought about the distinction between a plain yogurt and vanilla yogurt. And then looks in his cart and says, oh, I got vanilla yogurt, not plain yogurt. The shopper cannot just go to his shopping list and cross out plain and write in vanilla to get it to match the shopping cart. The point of a shopping list is to get the shopping cart to match the list because it is a world to mind direction of fit. How can this help explain what's going on in Federalist 78? Judges, Hamilton says, are supposed to be writing opinions that match the law, that match the Constitution. They're not trying to get the Constitution to match their ideas. They're not trying to be legislators. So the distinction between being a legislator, a maker of the law, and a judge making judgments about the law is the same as the distinction between mind to world and world to mind directions of fit that's explained by philosophers like Anscombe and Searle and lots of people in the last 50 years. Can you help me unpack this distinction a bit more? Is the difference between mind to world and world to mind the same as the more common distinction between what something is and what something ought to be? The distinction between is and ought is something that actually is repeated in almost every Federalist Society meeting. So the official statement the Federalist Society says about what they're devoted to, they say it is the job of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what the law ought to be. So the distinction is between judges who are looking at the law and saying that it is a certain way that's a different kind of activity from saying, looking at the law and saying it ought to be some other thing. So the distinction between is and ought is very, very similar to the distinction between mind to world and world to mind directions of fit. A world to mind direction of fit is the kind of thing that would be associated with a desire or a program to change things but a mind to world direction of fit is the kind of thing associated with an assessment or a report. 
trying to say what the law already is, not making it to be a certain kind of thing. Are there other critical distinctions made in philosophy that are also useful for law? Do you have any examples of how a distinction might be used to resolve a legal question? One very important distinction, both in the law and in philosophy, goes by lots of different names. It's most commonly known in the philosophy world as the distinction between sense and reference. These are terms that were most prominently used by a logician, Gottlob Frege, writing in German at the end of the 19th century, but there's actually a distinction from the 17th century, very similar to that, between comprehension and extension. So the philosopher Arnaud, A-R-N-A-U-L-D, the philosopher Arnaud in the Port Royal Logic, Arnaud and Nicole, distinguishes between the kinds of things that are comprehended by a term itself, expressed in terms of the cognitive value of a term, and the things to which the term applies. Those are the extension. The sense is what is expressed by the term, but the referent is the collection of things to which the term applies. The key distinction between comprehension or sense on the one hand and extension or reference on the other is the extension or reference can depend on the facts. So if I build a car, I am changing the extension or the referent of the term car because it refers, there's more cars out there in the world. If I take the word car, what is it talking about? It's talking about all the cars. And if I build a car, that is gonna change. But it's not changing the meaning expressed by the term car. Of course, the meaning expressed by the term car could change, but it's gonna change for completely different things than cause the extension or the reference of that term to change. This is a distinction which the Supreme Court has made many times. The clearest time that the court made this distinction was in 1926 in Euclid versus Ambler Realty. Euclid versus Ambler Realty in 1926 distinguishes very similarly between meaning and application. The court says, regulations, the wisdom, necessity, and validity of which, as applied to existing conditions, are so apparent that they are now uniformly sustained a century ago or even half a century ago, probably would have been rejected as arbitrary and oppressive. Such regulations are sustained under the complex conditions of our day for reasons analogous to those which justify traffic regulations, which before the advent of automobiles and rapid transit street railways would have been condemned as fatally arbitrary and unreasonable. And in this, there is no inconsistency. For while the meaning of constitutional guarantees never varies, the scope of their application must expand or contract to meet the new and different conditions which are constantly coming within the field of their operation. In a changing world, it is impossible that it should be otherwise. But although a degree of elasticity is thus imparted not to the meaning, italicized, but to the application, italicized, of constitutional principles, statutes, and ordinances, which, after giving due weight to the new conditions, are found clearly not to conform to the Constitution, of course, must fall. So a degree of elasticity is thus imparted not to the meaning, but to the application of constitutional principles. Is this a good distinction? It will be a good distinction if there is a genuine distinction between sense and reference. Very related distinction to sense and reference is the distinction between analytic judgments, those are judgments that are true in virtue of meaning, and synthetic judgments, judgments that are true not just in virtue of meaning, but also in virtue of how the world is. If you distinguish sense from reference, you've got to distinguish analytic from synthetic. Now, the terms analytic and synthetic were first used in this way by Immanuel Kant, but he takes the basic distinction from John Locke. It's also interesting to note that Arnaud's distinction between comprehension and extension was repeated by the logician Isaac Watts in his logic textbook of the 18th century, which James Madison used when he was a student at Princeton. 
and the distinctions in Federalist 37 between uncertainty about words and uncertainty about the world tracks the same distinction. Locke talked about uncertainty that's due to our expressions and uncertainty due to the way the world is. And that comes over into the way Madison was taught logic through Watts' textbook, and that comes out in Federalist 37. I want to go back to your first point about law and ethics. Can law ever be separated from morality? How does this help us understand the relationship between law and philosophy? Is the law separate from morality? Not entirely. So if you look at distinctions like the distinction between malum in se crimes and malum prohibitive crimes, well, you can see right away, you've got some crimes that are wrong in themselves. You can't talk about things that are wrong in themselves without talking about actual moral reality. So if you have a category in the law, which the law has, the criminal law has this category, malum in se, you can't talk about that category unless there is some kind of relationship between the criminal law and morality. On the other hand, you do have this contrasting category, malum prohibitum crimes, crimes that prohibit things that are not wrong in themselves, but are wrong only because the authorities have prohibited it. Well, in that case, you can't understand the wrongness of that crime simply by talking about morality. We have to go beyond morality if we're going to understand that kind of crime. So I think this distinction between malum in se and malum prohibitum both tells us how the law has to be rooted in morality in certain ways, but also distinguished from morality in other ways. Let's talk more about that. What is an example of how morality should or should not inform legal reasoning? How about in the case of constitutional interpretation? There are, I think, at least two and maybe three ways that morality or moral reality are relevant to constitutional interpretation. So one way is the way that Chief Justice Marshall used moral considerations in a case from 1805, U.S. versus Fisher. So in 1805, Marshall said, the mischiefs to result from the construction on which the United States insist have been stated as strong motives for overruling that construction. So he's looking at an argument that says, hey, if you adopt that interpretation, bad things will happen. That can't be the right reading of that statute because bad things, morally bad things, would happen if you had that reading. Here's what Marshall says. That the consequences are to be considered in expounding laws where the intent is doubtful is a principle not to be controverted. But it is also true that it is a principle which must be applied with caution and which has a degree of influence dependent on the nature of the case to which it is applied where rights are infringed, where fundamental principles are overthrown, where the general system of the laws is departed from, the legislative intention must be expressed with irresistible clearness to induce a court of justice to suppose a design to affect such objects. But where only a political regulation is made, which is inconvenient, if the intention of the legislature be expressed in terms which are sufficiently intelligible to leave no doubt in the mind when the words are taken in their ordinary sense, it would be going a great way to say that a constrained interpretation must be put upon them to avoid an inconvenience which ought to have been contemplated in the legislature when the act was passed and which in their opinion it was probably overbalanced by the particular advantages it was calculated to produce. So what Marshall is saying here is that look, right and wrong, whether something infringes fundamental rights, that is a guide to the intention of the legislature in doubtful cases. If we look at words and we think, I'm not sure what that means, we generally want to assume that the legislature was doing something that would be a good idea to do. 
So ethics, on the presumption that the legislature is reasonable and doing the right thing, ethics can be a guide to interpretation in this first sense. A second relevance for ethics has to do with this meaning application distinction. So sometimes the law, either in a statute or in a constitution, sometimes the law will use a term which itself has a partly moral meaning. So if you look at the way that courts have construed both the Privileges and Immunities Clause from Article 4 and the Privileges or Immunities Clause from the 14th Amendment, they have interpreted those words, the privileges of citizens, to mean roughly the privileges enjoyed by similarly situated fellow citizens of various kinds. Well, whether or not one citizen is similarly situated to another citizen requires some moral analysis in certain cases. So the most famous construction of Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1 before the Civil War, Corfield versus Coriel from 1825, Justice Bushrod Washington includes a list of lots of privileges of citizens, but then he adds this bit. He says these privileges are subject, nevertheless, to such restraints as the government may justly provide for the general good of the whole. So to figure out whether something is a privilege of citizens, you have to think at least a little bit about what the government can justly provide for the general good of the whole. There's a tacit restriction to cases in which the general good, the general moral good of the community, doesn't require something else. Justice Field, for instance, after his slaughterhouse dissent, he says a year later in the Bartermeyer case, he has a concurrence saying, well, of course, the government is allowed to do things like have a prohibition law because there's a tacit restriction of the privileges of citizens of the United States that allows for restrictions in the general good of everybody. As long as you're not discriminating, saying certain citizens can drink and others can't, a prohibition law could be in the general good of the whole but this is a partly moral consideration. So that's a second way that morality can be relevant to interpretation. A third way that morality is relevant, at least to what judges are doing in interpretation cases, has to do with precedent. So moral considerations can be relevant as we're thinking about the stakes involved in a decision. So a lot of epistemologists, talk about stakes-sensitive epistemology. They have an idea that when lots of things depend on a decision, you're going to want to be very, very careful about it. So we see this distinction in the law. Before we send somebody to jail for a crime, we say you got to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But if we say that somebody is going to be subject to a civil judgment, we say it only has to be proved by the preponderance of the evidence. Well, the epistemologists have looked at this and they say, the more that's riding on a decision, the more evidence you have to have. We can apply this to precedent and say, well, how much is riding on a decision can be part of how we decide whether to overrule a precedent and specifically how much evidence we need of the wrongness of that earlier precedent in order to overrule it. So if there's a grave moral risk involved in overturning a precedent, we're going to want to be really, really, really sure before we do it. Similarly, you might say the moral cost in making an error with respect to an instance of judicial review is going to be relevant to how much evidence, how clear the unconstitutionality has to be before you exercise judicial review. If the worry is if you make a mistake, it's going to be a moral disaster, if that's the case, you're going to require a lot more evidence of unconstitutionality than in an ordinary case where it only involves property or something that is not a moral catastrophe. Are good lawyers naturally good philosophers? The sorts of people who study philosophy, I think they get a, get a question and they their initial instinct is to say, well, it depends. 
depends on what some particular word means. That's the kind of answer that a philosopher will frequently give to a question, to think really carefully about exactly what the words in the question mean and say, well, it depends on whether that word means one thing or another. Also exactly the kind of thing that lawyers will do. I think young children, when they get parental guidance, they very frequently learn to say, well, mama, well, daddy, it depends on exactly what you mean by some key term. That's the lawyerly instinct. That's the philosophical instinct. And I think they're the same instinct. And the kinds of people who enjoy making distinctions like that, the kind of people who enjoy trying to keep other people from evading trying to keep other people from making moves like that. Those are the kind of people who are going to enjoy both being lawyers or being philosophers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on jurisprudence. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.